Hi friends, welcome back to this week's class of Dead Funny University. This week we are talking about Elder Scrolls, and I'm really excited because I've seen Elder Scrolls everywhere like every couple of years i feel like it just pops up again and i'm like didn't they already release this game and so i'm really looking forward to my confusion being answered by cody's expertise i am your host and fellow student kelsey and in case you didn't figure it out teaching us today is my good friend cody and cody how are you doing today and how long have you been playing elder scrolls okay so i'm doing pretty good and uh i will say this we're doing a couple videos on this um and this is the one that I am going to be the least prepared for and the most ignorant about because these are the two games that I did not know existed when I started playing Elder Scrolls. Like, when I started playing Elder Scrolls, it was Morrowind, and that was the third one. I didn't know it was the third one. I just started playing Morrowind and had no idea that there were two other incredible games behind it, but... The nature of these two games that we're going to be talking about today means that it's really hard. Like, I think you could play Morrowind, which is the third one. But these previous two, oh boy. It is, <laughs> it is a different world of very old, very esoteric RPGs on computer. Um, so I'm excited to talk about them because I actually learned quite about... Quite, I already knew a little bit about them, but I learned a little bit more... Um, getting into this and i have quickly found out that bethesda has been remaking the same elder scrolls game for like i think pushing 40 years no pushing 30 years like 32 years th th holy crap well actually no okay because that's yeah. early 90s are you confident about the 32 32 years, years. yeah 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 okay that's even late 80s at this point. No, I'm sorry. I misspoke. It's not 32 years. Okay. That's how long Bethesda has existed. Okay. It is um, 26 years. <laughs> They've been remaking the same game. And you'll see what I mean when we get into it. Still, that's like our age. Like, that's that's just barely <laughs> younger than me. Like, good lord yep. almighty. Yep, okay. sure is. All right. Well, I'm excited to jump into this. Do you have an opening quiz for me, or did you decide to skip that this time? I got an opening quiz for you, Kelsey. Let's do this. I'm excited about it. Okay, first question. Why is Bethesda called Bethesda? Is it A, the founder was from Bethesda? B, it's the founder's name? C, that was the name of something in a book that the founder of the company liked? Or C, D, not C, D, it's the name of the founder's pet? Oh, God. I like a couple of those actions, but I'm going to go with C. Uh, it was a uh, name in a book that the founder liked? Yes. Okay. What is the name of the first two games? I'm not going to give you options that like I usually do because I accidentally have told you this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Forgetting it's a question on my quiz. <laughs> and I promised I would forget, and I think I did. I think Arena, which is the thing that I think you said. Arena is one of them. The other one I'm going to guess is just Elder Scrolls. Like, I have no idea. I'll I'll give you I'll give you three options: Daggerfall, okay. Skyrim, or Oblivion. All right. Again, I feel like I'm cheating, and I'm going to go with Daggerfall. It is Daggerfall, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. What is the arena? You know, for titular Elder Scrolls, the arena is it a medieval Thunderdome? Thunderdome. Is it where John Cena lives? Is it the whole land? Is it the <laughs> player's own inner demons? Well, given the options, I'm hoping this game is clever and it's the oh, the player's own inner demons. All right. Now, this is this is a tricky one. What is the Numidium? Is it a giant robot? Is it a magic sword? Is it a magic wand? Uh, I did not actually finish filling in the quiz. So, <laughs> or is it a blank? <laughs> Well, I mean, you did narrow it down for me. That helps a lot. Oh, I love that you didn't finish playing that quick. This one only has three. Giant robot, magic sword, magic wand. What is the Numidium? Oh, God, it sounds so esoteric. Oh, I love it. The uh, names are ridiculous. <laughs> I hate this game's names. They are bonkers. <laughs> I'm going to go with magic sword. Uh, Okay. 
And where are the Dark Elves from? Morrowind, Breaker Falls, the Underdark, or Mirkwood? All right. Well, the Underdark feels a little too D and D for me. <laughs> That's because I've... it literally is from D and D. Yes, it literally is from D and D, and I've heard that one. Um, I forgot the other option, uh, actions or options. Cheese. Sorry. Morrowind, Breaker Falls, Mirkwood. Mirkwood. I'm pretty sure Mirkwood is also D and D. So I'm going to go with Morrowind, which is the only one I haven't heard of before. That that is correct. You nailed it. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> Mirkwood is not D and D. It is, however. A proper noun oh, from Lord of the Lord Rings. Lord of the Rings, yes. Which or or the Hobbit. Yeah. Um, also, name was just lifted and directly put into one of the Elder Scrolls games. Because <laughs> the founders of this game were nerds. All right. <laughs> I like me a nerd. That's fantastic. So what we're going to be talking about today is Elder Scrolls 1 and 2. First one being Arena. The second one being Daggerfall. But... Going even back further than that, let's talk a little bit about Bethesda Softworks, which is the company that made the Elder Scrolls series. They are now making Doom. They've made um, like Fallout, Fallout 76, um, Dishonored, like tons of games, right? Mm -hmm. Super prolific. Um, the company was founded in Bethesda, Maryland in 1988. And the first game that they made was... Wayne Gretzky Hockey for the Atari Macintosh, N Macintosh NES and DOS. So, oh my god, that is such a title that like clearly defines the era that it was from. That's amazing. Wayne Gretzky <laughs> Hockey. Wayne so they went from Wayne Gretzky Hockey to one of the biggest RPG fantasy games ever. <laughs> that was the span of the company. That um, is quite a spread. Holy cow. It's it's a pretty big pretty big jump. So game number one, hockey. Game number two was a Terminator game. They made like a series of these that was for like the NES and DOS. Um oh actually, do you know what DOS is? Yes, I do. Okay, okay, cool. So it was released for you know computers and for Nintendo Entertainment System. And then after that, so 1988, Wayne Gretzky Hockey. 1990, Terminator. And then 1994 was the next game that they released. And this was Elder Scrolls Arena. Now, I actually downloaded and played this game a little bit. And just for fun, I, I paid attention. It was 30 megabytes to download this game. The latest Elder Scrolls game, Skyrim, was 22 gigabytes. Oh, which is a thousand times more information. Yeah. <laughs> so if you ever want a clear idea of how technology is scaled between 1994 and whenever Skyrim released, which I don't know off the top of my head, 30 megabytes to 22 gigabytes. Wow. Um, so this game, when it, in its original conception, Elder Scrolls Arena was going to be an arena fighting game. It was going to be like, you make a character, you go into arena, you kill things in the arena, you level up in the arena, then you go to a new arena, and you kill more stuff. And it was very, very, very inspired by pen and paper tabletop RPGs. So this was super derivative of Dungeons and Dragons. Like, when you make a character, you literally would roll a character, and then it would, like, have stats that populated randomly... So very D&D-esque. The setting also was very inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. There's dragons and dungeons. There's goblins. There's monsters at night. You seek treasure, you loot. Very familiar for the time that this was made. Um, now, the result of what they ended up making was impressive because it was huge. But it was also really buggy and weird. Like the controls. So like you kind of know generally how a game is controlled now right mm -hmm. so like wasd move no no arrow keys mm. and it's forward turn left turn right and back step so you can't strafe side to side um you do use your mouse to click mouse to click on things on the screen but it does not have mouse look if you want to attack you have to hold the right mouse button and swing your mouse around like you're swinging your sword and that oh. makes the sword animation swing. Like, when I first loaded into the game, I died because I couldn't figure out how to kill a rat and there were no instructions. <laughs> and I also couldn't figure out how to equip a sword. 
without Googling it. Um, Unexpected so, wiki game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, and I mean, it's just because there were no standards yet. These games did not exist. Mm-hmm. The genre hadn't been invented yet and was not commonplace enough for it to really be a thing. Um, so originally this was envisioned to be Elder Scrolls Arena where we do arena combat. And then it kind of grew into something else. Um, they found out that exploring the areas in between the arenas was actually really fun. And it ballooned into this massive open world game. The thing is huge. Like, it really, it's like th- no one really has good documentation on like what game has the largest overworld ever. But Elder Scrolls 1 Arena is in the running still. Really? Yeah, because it's like every other Elder Scrolls game since then, including Daggerfall, the other one we're going to talk about, takes place in one small area of Elder Scrolls Arena. So like Skyrim, Morrowind, uh, Oblivion 2, and Daggerfall, all of those regions are in Elder Scrolls Arena. You can go to them. So there's like a city in Skyrim, the latest game that came out called Riverwood. You can go to Riverwood in Elder Scrolls 1. It's there. (laughs) It looks completely different, but it's there. Um, And yeah, this was like crazy. This was like the hugest thing ever. It was super impressive, right? And it was made by people that made hockey before this, right? Um, Now, when this game released, though, not actually super popular, Um, For a lot of reasons. One, they missed their deadline. It was supposed to release at Christmas. It didn't. The other one is, I sent you um, some box art for Elder Scrolls Arena, and there's like a very overly sexualized picture of a woman on the front in like a chainmail bikini, and that made distributors be like, what is this weird like porn game? We don't want to sell this. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And the reality is... Wow. (laughs) Yeah, right? Like, are you looking at the box cover right now? I am. (laughs) Yeah, right? So no one wanted to buy it. It sold very poorly. But then slowly through word of mouth, it got like a cult following. It became popular way after it came out. Um, So once the game released, they immediately started working on the sequel, Daggerfall, which is why I kind of put these together, because in a lot of ways, the structures of the games and even their appearance is very similar. Um, So Elder Scrolls... Are- so sorry, Elder Scrolls Daggerfall was in some ways even larger, even though by geography it was smaller. So the region that it took place in was, um, sorry, let me scroll further down in my notes here. It was in the region High Rock and Daggerfall were like the two, oh no, Kelsey, I put something wrong in my notes. You can't be wrong on the internet, Cody. What's wrong with you? I've made a mistake. No! And I must own up to it. I can actually cut this if you if you don't want to be wrong on the internet. No, it's fine. It's High Rock and Hammerfell, not Daggerfall. Daggerfall is a city in Hammerfell. Anyways, um, so it takes place in, like, two of the, like, eight countries in Elder Scrolls Arena. But it went into a crazy amount of detail, like, boasting thousands of unique cities like hundreds of thousands of npcs the thing was incredibly detailed there were like multiple kingdoms that all had their own politics and if you like helped one it made the other one mad um it added a bunch of new mechanics like you could create spells you could become a vampire you could become a werebore all sorts of really cool stuff and the other big shift here is that this was now fully 3d graphics so do you know what the difference between a sprite and a like 3d model is? i think i do but just to make sure and to make sure the audience is also comfortable please explain sure so a sprite is like you'll see them in 3d games but they're flat and they just face towards you so you look at it and it's a flat picture Mm -hmm. um whereas a full 3d model has depth in the engine right yes so in arena everything was a sprite you were looking at flat pictures on the screen in daggerfall they switched to now being full 3d models so it looks a lot better and just like every bit of the engine got better and this was kind of where they sort of learned how to make an elder scrolls game with elder scrolls one 
and then made Elder Scrolls 2. So Elder Scrolls 2 is kind of like the purest one, right? Because it had like some, it had a first draft, right? That got made better. Yeah. Now, Daggerfall is one of the games that the fan base, some of them rally behind as this is the best Elder Scrolls game. Is Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall. It has the most NPCs, the most detailed kingdoms, super creative. It has a bonkers plot that we'll get into in a minute. <laughs> um, but it is also not devoid of issues. So in a game this big, and this is true for like kind of Elder Scrolls throughout their history, which is that they have very clever development that lets them make huge games really easily. This is even true in Skyrim. So there's a main quest and there's a few side quests that are like, we wrote these, they're scripted, they work. And then they just put in a thing that randomly would generate quests in the world. Oh, cool. So you go up to a guild hall, like you go into the fighters guild and say, I want work. They'll give you a quest. It's randomly generated. Now that sounds awesome. In reality, those quests would sometimes be totally impossible, <laughs> like, or just broken. It wasn't a perfect system. So, yeah, technically there were infinite quests that you could play through, but sometimes they just didn't work and you could, like, break them accidentally. So it was plagued with a lot of issues, which is why it doesn't have that, like, clout of being the greatest Elder Scrolls universally. Well, um, quick question for you. I hate to sure. interrupt. No, you're but, good. But, um, A... Randomly generated quests, is this significantly different than um, randomly generated encounters? Which are pretty uh, standard, but just kind of occur randomly. Yes. Okay. So there were random encounters, like enemies would spawn around you and they scaled with level, and that was true even in Arena. Mm -hmm. um, the quests would be like, you would go up and talk to someone and they'd be like, go to this cave, find this amulet, bring it back to me. And that was randomly generated. But the problem was sometimes they would send you to a place that you couldn't go to, or they would send you to get an item that wasn't there, or you could get the item before the quest was given to you and it would break. Um, ah, so okay. there was there was a lot of... It was a cool idea. It just it wasn't well enough implemented to be like foolproof. And it still is like... That's why people are still kind of harsh on Daggerfall. Um, the AI behind it wasn't quite... De Quite good right, so we right, and I mean, they're in, they're throwing the tracks in front of them as they're going here. There's not like an established way of doing this yet, because like now there are procedurally generated games, mm -hmm. and this was around the time that people were like still kind of figuring out how to do that. Well, you yeah. know, it wasn't as an step as established of a genre. Um, yeah, and I, I heard someone describe it as this game was not procedurally generated; it was randomly generated, and there's a difference between those <laughs> things. <laughs> um, that feels like a little bit of a dagger. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a jab, but it's you know I mean this was this was an impressive undertaking. Mm -hmm. It's it is more detailed than any Elder Scrolls game that has come out since, and it was made. When did this come out? I don't remember now. Nineteen ninety six. You know. Oof. And so yeah. to make sure that I have my notes right, Arena is considered the best Elder Scrolls game, or Daggerfall is. Daggerfall. Or it is contentious. Like, basically, no one really says Arena is the best one. Anyone that likes Arena is like, but Daggerfall is the truest form. Um, there are the some people... Form? Yeah, okay. there are some people that are like, Daggerfall is the best one. It it gave you the most freedom as well. So, like, being a thief suddenly became... You could, like, climb up walls and sneak into houses. That was added in Daggerfall. And that remained in the rest of the games. But it was so... Like, you would go into a city... And I guess I didn't get into this. Like, I don't have you played Skyrim? No, I haven't. I'm completely ignorant about all of Okay. Scrolls. No, this will this will be cool when you see like a city in Skyrim versus a city in Daggerfall. Mm -hmm. A city in Daggerfall is the size of a city. It's massive. It's huge. A city in Skyrim is maybe like 30 buildings, and that's huge in Skyrim. Oof. There were like hundreds of buildings in each city, and there were thousands of cities. It was enormous. Like bonkers detailed so a there are plot quests in addition to these randomly generated quests right it yes does this game right have plot? okay it does the game does have plot we're gonna get to that in a moment <clears throat> why why were why was arena and daggerfall why were they so big it feels like somebody was really dedicated to creating a world and they got so focused on creating a world that the game just kind of got lumped onto a world from what you're telling me um i think in the case of arena it was like 
they I think originally the idea was you would go to different countries and fight in their arena. Um, but then what they found out was that it was more fun to wander out into the wild and find a cave and then go and explore that cave. <laughs> so that became more of the focus of the game. Just yeah. because I think they found out that the arena battles weren't actually that interesting. And it was more interesting to go on like this big long quest because I mean, look at what they're inspired by. It's Dungeons and Dragons and Lord of the Rings. Like this is the heyday of those um, properties being influential in media. So they were going to want to copy something, you know, they were going to want to have their Lord of the Rings like map, you know, in the front of the book where you could go to all these different places and see all these things. And that's still true today. I mean, you still see that in video games where mm -hmm. creators want to give you this big, cool, detailed map. Um, and I mean, they made a map good enough that they're still using it <laughs> today to make Skyrim, you know, the, and also the, uh, Elder Scrolls Online came out. It's also using these same regions and just giving them more detail and rendering them in not horrible, ugly graphics. Man, whatever um, designer was in charge of that map has to be sitting back years later and being like, I am the king. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think the, what is the latest Elder Scrolls Online is like elsewhere or something. That's in a, that's in arena. It's a region in arena you can go to. It's worth mentioning that everything in arena is totally flat. There are, there is no terrain. It's just all flat. And it's like varying degrees of green or green with white on top of it or like brown. But it's all just a flat plane. <laughs> it's just nothing. Was that because like the graphics around yeah, that's 3D graphic was limitations. kind of just too hard at that time? Yeah, they they literally didn't have 3D models yet in games. Got it, it was yep. you had a 3D space, but they were all flat objects. Nothing had depth in the game yet. You know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. Did you have any other questions? Uh oh yes, the Daggerfall, the full 3D models that you mentioned. Yes. Were those polygon graphics or were those like a little bit more like detailed? No, they they would have looked like really bad. Full PlayStation full graphics. on polygons. All right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's 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 not good, but it's better. <laughs> but it's better than flat. All right. I got yeah, you. I'm yeah. 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 I mean this this would look like an N64 game, maybe a little better. Was this game meant to make D and D? more accessible because around the time that this started there was that like cultural weird thing where they're like oh D, D people are murderers and weirder nerds i don't think so i think it was more that these people clearly played D D and were like well let's make that well and actually for daggerfall um there was a role-playing system called gurps um which that's an acronym i do not remember what it stands for and they just used gurps as their um engine for stats and combat because okay. like in these in these older games and this is even true in morrowind like mm -hmm. the next and i think oblivion as well when you swing your sword it's real-time combat but it's a dice roll whether you hit so it, it oh. literally works like playing dungeons and dragons yeah like okay. you're like it's very inspired at some points totally transparently by tabletop rpgs um and granted there's more of those than dungeons and dragons and if you're at the point of making a video game kind of based on them, you probably have knowledge of others, but yeah. Now, do you see that dice roll on your screen or is it just one of those no. like in the background things? Okay, It's in the background. It's like hits or misses. There are games where you do like there were contemporary games in like the computer RPG um, realm at this time where you would literally see dice rolls on your screen. And and that makes sense. And that also brings me, in the time that this came out, I think turn-based combat was more normal to see in video games. And I put that in big air quotes. Was this turn-based or was this no. real-time fighting? It was real-time. It was real-time, okay. yeah. Got it. Um, And I don't want to say you're wrong about that. You can say I'm wrong. I, I can be wrong. <laughs> I think that there has always been both like way That's back true. when you know got like arcades like mortal Kombat, which is definitely yeah. real time and i mean there were arcades that were like a sprite on a screen where the attack button was still you hit the attack button and the attack happens mm -hmm. um i think at this time it was easier to add a lot of depth with turn-based combat because it kind of let it lent itself better to a um, to the computers at the time and the processing at the time. It's really hard 
to make a 3D battle feel good. As we found out when we started getting 3D games and they all were way clunkier than 2D games. (laughs) Um, And this is true for that. It's super clunky to have a battle. You don't feel very epic when you're like just standing still and just swinging a sword awkwardly horizontally. But you know, when you swing your mouse, it would swing the sword. So that felt good. But yeah, it was, I think that turn-based combat, I think has fallen a little bit by the wayside as like 3d more athletic combat has gotten better and we've gotten better at implementing it in games. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So it sounds like they may have started trying to create kind of mortal combat in a different format and then kind of because it started as an arena. Yeah. yeah, And then ended up making a D and D game instead. One of the best worlds that video games have ever seen. So (laughs) that is it for my questions. Please continue. Thank you for making space for that. Okay, no, that's great. So, real quick, we're going to run down the races in, in I almost said D&D, because these are going to be real similar. Um, so, there are the Nords, which are um, unsurprisingly inspired by Nordic people, and they live in Skyrim. There are the Khajiit, who are, like, descended from cats. And in later games, they, like, look like cats. In Arena, they just look like people with red mohawks. Um... <laughs> The Red Guards and the Bretons are both basically human, but just in a different region, you know, from each other. Um, uh, Nords as well are basically just like human, just different areas where humans live. Then there's the Argonians. They are swamp de- they are swamp dwelling lizards that um. And even in Arena, they, like, look fairly lizardy, but as, like, the game goes on, you know, they're, like, little kind of dragony looking dudes. Um, and then there are Wood Elves, High Elves, or Dark Elves slash Dunmer. They call themselves the Dunmer, and generally other people refer to them as Dark Elves. That's in Morrowind. Um, so the Wood Elves live in Valenwood, which is, um, like, a living forest, kind of. The High Elves live in the Somerset Isles, which is like a mountainous kind of tropical area. And the Dark Elves live in Morrowind, which is like this volcanic and very alien land. Um, So then that kind of leads us into... Well, and okay, so real quick, though, with the races. Um, Very much like D&D, each races, each of the racial choices have different bonuses to your stats. Um, So you can like min-max a character by being like, Oh, if I want to be a guy with an axe, be a Nord. Oh, I want to be a wizard, be a high elf. I want to be a thief, be a wood elf. Like, you can min-max your character that way because, like, you would then go and pick, like, a class to play as, very much like D&D again. Um, But it wasn't required that you did that min-maxing, so, like, any race could play any of the classes. But, yeah, it, it had that mechanic in as well, which is, again, very familiar for tabletop uh games and then the settings and these are still being used in elder scroll elder scrolls games today you have the somerset isles like i said that's where the high elves live high rock and hammerfell that is where the red guards and the bretons live skyrim it's the home of the nords which when you play sky or when we talk about skyrim we'll get into that there's the imperial province which actually doesn't have a like race associated with it but it's like the center of the empire. Uh, Valenwood, like I said, that is where the Wood Elves live. Um, then there is Elsewhere, which is where the Khajiit are from. Black, I put Blackwash. I'm pretty sure it's Black Marsh, and I just wrote it wrong. Um, Black Marsh is where the Argonians are. And funny story, in Elder Scrolls Arena, a main plot point happens at Mirkwood in the black marsh because they stole stuff (laughs) because nerds right all over this all right (laughs) and finally we have morrowind which takes place in or where the dark elves are from it's like a volcanic isle um so that's kind of like the world at large and i i sent you a picture of a map so you could like see where all those different areas are um so yeah, you ready oh. to talk about some some lore? I'm loving some... the eight bit graphics that I can see here. This is this is fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty rough. 
I like that they took the time to make a whole bunch of different kingdoms with different, like, legitimately different topography and things like that. So you do. Yeah. Know. And as these games go on, you can explore each of these in greater detail and get kind right. of a feel for the space. That's yeah, a way of thinking about it is literally every game since Arena has been an expansion pack where they're like, yeah, we did a sucky job of this in Arena, so let me redo it better. That's what every <laughs> game has been since. <laughs> that's That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> All right, so we've got our major races, which look, looks like there's five of them. We've got our major places, which most of these attribute one of their species to. Now, did you mention major classes? Um, I didn't. There okay. are a bunch. <laughs> but Do you like... want to go through it, or should we just skip over it as it's relevant? Um, you know what? You know what? You asked about it, so I can I can really <laughs> quick I can really quick run them down for you here. All right. So you have. <clears throat> Warriors, knights, rangers, archers, monks, barbarians, uh, mages, sorcerers, healers, battle mages, spell swords, knight blades, thieves, burglars, assassins, rogues, acrobats, and bards. All right, I got like the first eight of those and then could not keep up. If you ask me anything about the classes, I am going to give you a very disappointed look. Go I'm ahead. not gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna? Oh, no. I said I'm not gonna, I oh, promise. Good. Thank there's God. there's right. just so many of them and I could like tell it, but it's like you know what a knight is, it's a knight, you know? Yeah. Um but I anyways. figure out what an acrobat does. Right. And really all that does is give you different proficiencies to use like different weapons and stuff. So it's it's less relevant than you would imagine. All okay, right. so you're ready for the deep, deep lore. Yes, give me deep lore. Okay, so Uriel Septim is the emperor of Tamriel. Tamriel is the whole world, right? Tyre region's called Tamriel. His and name is Uriel Septim? Uriel Septim. I'm going to try to use a lot of names, especially in the story for the first game, because they are bonkers. That is a so terrible name. So Uriel Septim is the emperor of everything, which puts a big target on his back, and generally in all of the Elder Scrolls games, like, all of these different countries have been conquered by the Empire. None of them are happy about it. Anyways, so, the Imperial Battle Mage, whose name is Jaeger Tharn, summons Uriel Septim and his main general, Talon Warhaft, to his chambers because there's a conspiracy to do some bad stuff. So they show up in the Imperial Battle Mage's chambers, and surprise, the conspiracy is the Imperial Battle Mage Traps both of them in, like, a demonic parallel realm. Turns himself into a, like, mirror image of the Emperor. And then just starts summoning demons. He's just full evil now. So for all of the people of Tamriel, it's like, oh, we have a king. He's kind of okay, even though none of us like being conquered. And all of a sudden, he's summoning demons, right? Now, the only person that witnessed this happen is... Thar so the Imperial Mage, Jaeger Tharns, uh, apprentice whose name is Rhea Silmane. So Rhea Silmane sees this, and because of that, Tharn kills her. Oh no, she's dead. But she uses her magic to basically like shed her corporeal form and become a plot ghost that tells you what to do throughout the game. Oh my god. God, all right. <laughs> so you are a prisoner. You have done something wrong. And this is where, like, there really isn't a character because this is like you make a character and then go and play it. So whoever you are, you're in the dungeon. You get summoned. or So you're in a dungeon and Rhea drops a key in your cell and helps you escape from the dungeon and then teleports you to your homeland. And she's like, okay, look, things are bad. They're summoning demons. Stuff is getting crazy. What I'm going to need you to do is go to all the different kingdoms and find a piece of the Staff of Chaos, which is the device that the Imperial Battle Mage Jaeger Tharn used to disappear the king and turn himself into a copy, or not the king, the emperor, and turn himself into a copy of the emperor, right? So that is your MacGuffin. And then you go to all the different realms find a dungeon, beat the dungeon, get a piece of the Staff of Chaos, and then at the end you find out that the orb on the top of the staff is stored in um, the Imperial Province. So you go there, you get that last bit of the staff, you defeat Jaeger Tharn, it opens a rift and lets 
Uriel Septum and his general Phelan Warharft come back out of whatever weird parallel demonic realm they were in, and you've saved the day and become the eternal champion of the Empire. Right? I mean, sure. My guess is it may not end there. <laughs> well, it does. That's the end of the first game. It's actually pretty straightforward. Like, the first game, the plot of it, not that crazy. Um, now, the second game... Okay, so like I said, these are the games that I have not played, so I'm not as experienced with their plots. Okay. The second game's plot is bonkers. <laughs> like, it is fully crazy, so I'm going to lay it out for you here. So, Uriel Septim had a bad day. Time moves on. The game Daggerfell is set in what's called the Iliac Bay. Now, the Iliac Bay is, like I said, um above how the uh, Red Gardens, the Bretons, are from High Rock and Hammerfell. Mm -hmm. Those two countries are basically both, like, atop or below the Iliac Bay, which is, like, a jut of ocean that goes into the land. So it's, like, this bay area is where those two groups of people are. That is, that just that little area is the setting for Daggerfell, right? So okay. basically, the king of that entire area whose name is, oh gosh, let me scroll up to my notes, <laughs> King Lysandius. Okay, he gets killed. And hang on, I need to click to some other notes. Oh, this feels a little Battle of Troy already, but we will roll with it. <laughs> um, you know, like, honestly, you're not exactly wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, it feels very referential right now. <laughs> okay, so Lysandius gets killed. And you get sent to the Iliac region to be like, okay, why is Lysandius dead? What's going on there, right? And this is where a bunch of crazy stuff with letters happen. So the emperor sent a letter to one of his secret agents. So all over the world, there are these agents of the emperor known as the Blades. Um, they become plot focus for the rest of the games. Like basically the main storyline in every Elder Scrolls game is always you working with the Blades. Um, which are like the secret police of the empire. So he's like, hey, I sent a, a letter to this agent. They didn't respond. They didn't get it. And basically half the game is you go and try to figure out who killed Lysandius and where this letter went that the emperor sent trying to figure out what was going on. And it's like everyone is sending all of these backstabbing letters and buying letters and sending you letters because, like I said, this game had thousands of cities and like i think something like 50 different kingdoms in it Oof. and all of them are vying for power um on top of that there is an orc warlord called um gortwart the is it gortwart the victorious so gortwart the victorious is an orc warlord that wants to like carve out a piece of um i think what is high rock and claim it for the orcs because the orcs need a homeland um then there's also um in the under king which is like the king of the undead he's also kicking around and wants power but really what the under king wants is to die because he was cursed by the first um septum so like you know we're at Ur uriel septum the first um, septum that conquered everything was Tiber, I believe. Ty yeah, Tiber septum. So his battle mage, he cursed to like live forever and he became the under king. So that guy's also kicking around and trying to vie for power and also get enough power that he can finally let himself die. Um, <laughs> so all of these people are sending letters. They're all mad at each other. The king of this entire region gets killed and then it's like, now every other king is like, I'm the new greatest king. And meanwhile, the empire and the emperor is like, hey, civil unrest up in that area. Go take care of it, right? <laughs> All right. So that's like the backdrop. Got it. You go there to figure out what's going on here. So when you get there, eventually what you find out is that Lysandius was killed by another king, obviously. That other king was in possession, possession of something called the Totem of Tiber. 
the totem of Tiber is said to be this like super powerful thing that can like, um, you know, it's basically like a useful weapon. Right. But when you go and find it, it just looks like a little, like it's supposed to look like a little baby kind of, um, but it's this totem that's really important. So throughout the game, you meet a bunch of different people that want it. So the emperor wants it. The orcs want it. The under King wants it. All of the different kings in that region want it. Everyone wants this little thing because they're all trying to grab for power. So at the end of the game, you eventually find that little dude, the totem of Tiber, and you have to give it to somebody, right? Um, so there's really no right answer. This is like an end with a lot of moral ambiguity. But you pick something, give it to them, and then what you have to do is go to another dungeon and touch the mantrell which is a soup or the mantel, the mantella. Sorry. You touch the mantella, which is like a super powerful orb that it turns the totem of Tiber into the Nimodium. And the Nimodium is an ancient dwarven super robot that is like an unstoppable killing machine. <laughs> so the, the plot of this is about, who you decide to give a super robot to. I did not see this becoming who do you want to give a super robot to. <laughs> That's why I loved that quiz question oh, so much. Oh my god. <laughs> it's not exactly a super robot, but when it's a bronze golem, I don't know what else to call that. It's a bronze thing that they give life to, which to me makes it a super robot. Um, oh, that's the closest thing they could get to a robot. Out of curiosity, a lot of games would fall into the, like, there's a clear morally correct person to give this to, and there's a clear morally incorrect, like, everybody else is going to be various shades of gray all the way down to, like, you're pure evil. Do they play that game, or is everybody shades of gray and you kind of have to do the best you can? There are some obvious wrong answers, I would say, um, but... No. Um, and so here's the tricky thing, right? Is there is a continuous lore through all these games, right? And in this game, there's branched endings. So when we get to Elder Scrolls 3, well, what does history say happened in the last game? The answer is after um, you give someone that thing and you go and touch the mantella and activate it the game ends and you'll get one ending based on who you give it to but in the lore of the games overall doing this action created something known as the warp of the west or the miracle of peace in which all of the different possible endings happened simultaneously in different timelines and then became the truth this is the acrobatics they have to do to get this end to make sense. Elder Scrolls 3 was like, I don't want to import that information, so peace. Everybody just peace, and we're just going to call it peace. Oh so, my god. All of the different kings all, like, kind of maintain power in their little areas. The under king gets it and uses its power to kill himself because he's wanted to die forever. The Orcish Warlord is able to use it to cut out a little chunk of land to make the Orcish homeland, and the Orcs are then adopted into the Empire. And the Orcs also then manage to, like, fend off the Imperial forces that are trying to conquer them. And Tamriel is united again under the Empire, <laughs> because all of them happened at once. Because all of those are the individual ends, right? Mm -hmm. So if you give it to the orcs, the orcs get their homeland. If you give it to the empire, they quash the unrest. If you give it to one of the kings, which you can give it to like any of the however many kings in that region, then they get to become the new king of that area, you know? So there's like a bunch of different endings. And then Elder Scrolls went, eh, they all happen. Everything's fine. That's probably better for well how many years between was there i'm i think you probably have this information how many years was there between the end of daggerfell and elder scrolls 3 oh you know i don't actually have that right off the top of my head but i can tell you 
Because I'm wondering if they didn't intend to make a third one, and then the second one was successful enough that they're like, oh, crap, let's make a third one. Let's keep the lore continuous. Oh, shit. There are 50 different endings. We don't want to pick one of these. It's become too popular in the meantime. Like, we'll we'll just do the best we can and move forward. So it was longer. So Morrowind came out in 2002, okay. and... Uh, um so that's a full that's eight that's six years excuse it's me six years yeah, yeah. so 1996 was a was mm -hmm. uh dagger fell um so yeah there was a decent amount of time i could see that being the case that they didn't know they were going to make a sequel and then when they did they had to like figure out what they were going to do um but yeah these games were really like hugely influential even at the time they were like technical masterpieces these were like crazy things that had never been done on this scale before and even though like the earliest game was so bare bones and minimalistic i mean the lore that they set up is still being used to make games today um so it's interesting to see how humble the beginnings are when you look at something like elder scrolls arena and then skyrim remastered like the amount of the amount that they have been able to be more creative with the visuals and with the storytelling and having voice acting and all of these really cool elements that they're now able to add into the game it's it's interesting to see how it's grown from like a tiny little team making this like poopy indie game to like oh my gosh it's like the biggest game ever skyrim you know it it sounds like they i i wonder if they intentionally made something that was so time proof or if it was just a passion project that accidentally created something that like i mean that that happens all the time yeah <laughs> it was a passion project that just accidentally created something that is so that is oh i can't think of the word that i'm that i'm looking for here but just transformative and and functional i guess well and i think for like a property it's massive enough and like diverse enough that like when you go between like now like when you when we get to morrowind morrowind looks like super alien land and then you go to skyrim and it just looks like a medieval village and you know all of these different areas can have so much flavor because even way back when they described them just with text as being kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And then because the game got a following, I think that there was a fan base of like, hey, do you guys want to see more about Morrowind? Because we didn't make it the way we imagined it, and now we can. So here's Morrowind, you know, a more detailed game. Oh, that's um, so cool. So it's neat. It's neat to see how the games have progressed and how the mechanics... Like, it's cool to see what mechanics are still there from arena to skyrim because there are a few um and what mechanics like go away and get replaced um yeah, that's all very fascinating to me because there's even like in morrowind you still like in in arena if you like push your mouse forward you stab and if you swing your mouse from side to side you slash Mm -hmm. That's kind of still in Morrowind, but it's which direction you're walking, you know, that like different weapons would like slash or thrust or hack, you know, there were like different attacks you could do with each weapon like that didn't go away until Oblivion, you know, that weird mechanic that eventually they were just like, no one's doing this anymore. Why do we still have it in here? <laughs> um, so standards changed and then they adapted and matched those yeah. standards. Yeah. And Skyrim really was the biggest one that had a shift, but I don't want to spoil all of that on this episode <laughs> yeah not yet okay i've interrupted you a lot to ask questions thank you so much for for dealing with that do you have more that you want to tell me or do i have, uh, I have more no questions to ask if you have more questions that's cool that or i got your ending quiz Ooh, yeah no i got more questions to ask so are there it sounds like this is a game of politics meaning that while there are many characters there may not be definitive enemies are there any definitive definitive enemies yeah, all over the place. There's tons of monsters constantly. Okay, just like, like random monsters kind of thing. Yeah, there yeah any, there's like, like human... goblins and well, there's there's bandits, you know, and okay. like random people out in the world that'll try to kill you, like sorcerers or whatever. Um, and yeah, so no, there there are definitely just like stock bad monster is bad, you know, okay. and and a lot of those, especially in arena too. It was like very much just like the monster manual from dungeons and dragons kind of renamed you know there's 
skeletons or whatever, you know. But outside of like the the Jaeger foreign guy that you mentioned, nobody else really stands out as like a rival or or anything like that. No, there's not usually okay. like a big NPC rival to you. Like you're kind of off on your own little quest. And I mean, like individual quest lines might have like a big bad in them, like go and kill this mage or go and stop this yeah. necromancer or whatever. His name's something ridiculous. <laughs> um, <laughs> But in in lore, there's not, like, a counterpart to you that's, like, stopping your actions or anything like that. Got it. Okay. Now, how about romances? Was that in these games at all? Interesting thing. In these two, no. It was an intended feature that they wanted to add in Daggerfall. And I, they, they never got around to it, so no. Um, okay. By the time Skyrim rolls around, yes. And I know Morrowind, I think it's also a no. I don't remember with Oblivion if romance was a Got it. Magic systems. Is it just the standard D&D magic system, or do we have other unique things going on? So magic was in is in all the games. Um, there are mage classes that can use magic. In, I think, Arena was where they started doing, like, spell crafting. And where you could, like, customize spells by, like, mixing effects and stuff like that. And that is kind of prevalent in the rest of the Elder Scrolls games. There's a little bit of maybe contention around that with Skyrim. Um, but fairly in-depth magic systems are, like, a part of as far back as Daggerfall and some kind of, like, throw fireball spells were in Arena. Okay, and because this is one universe, one lore, it's all connected, I'm going to guess that there isn't a separate magic system for each game. Is there a separate magic system for each species even? Or is it all kind of, if you can throw fireballs as a mage um, Khajiit, for example, you can throw fireballs as a mage Nord? Yeah, generally, yes. Um, More so based on the classes the than anything else? It's not really even based on the classes. Like, anyone can basically do magic if your, like, skill points are high enough, you know? Okay. Um, and anyone can get skill points high enough to do that. And there's not, like... Mm, there are some, like... I think that if you're, like, a high elf in Morrowind, you can get, like, an Ancestral Guardian where you, like, summon a ghost to fight for you. Okay, but so you can also... You can get a spell called Summon Ancient Guardian. So some, like, races start with, like, a spell automatically or, like, a bonus spell, you know? But generally, they're accessible to everybody. Um, the magic systems change drastically throughout the games, though. Like, between Morrowind and Oblivion, they're pretty similar. Skyrim, it's, like, totally different. Completely different magic. Um... There's not, like, an in-lore explanation for that. It's because the old magic systems were clumsy and complicated and... And we have better technology and the better ability yeah, to do There's cool just, things. like... Let's do it. It's more that we... Uh, this is getting in a little bit to what we'll cover in the Skyrim episode, but okay. Skyrim was, like, the first mainstream game that they made. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Morrowind and Oblivion were pretty esoteric and difficult to get into. Skyrim, they didn't make it more complicated. They streamlined a lot. They made it much more user-friendly, which made it a lot ah. slicker to play, but it lost a lot of depth, um, okay. which yeah. is why Skyrim, for, like, hardcore fanboys, is a contentious one because it's beautiful, it's very detailed, great story, gutted a lot of the possible gameplay. Oof. Okay. I will I will not ask any questions about that. I will wait until <laughs> our Skyrim episode. I will respect your your authority and pacing as a teacher. It sounds like this was primarily or even exclusively a PC game, both of these. Is that correct? Um I believe so, and that becomes untrue with Morrowind. I believe Morrowind got an Xbox port and that was the first time it was on console. Okay. And then Yeah, these were DOS games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DOS. Yeah. Now 
you Link has I'm not sure I'm not even gonna make that comparison because I don't know shit about Zelda so I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut um let me let me not be wrong on the internet on a show where I no things. man you can be wrong about Link I'll let you know don't worry <laughs> I he gets something I think it's called the Master Sword is yes. there anything you know I, guys I'm trying I, I didn't call him <laughs> Zelda so I'm a step in the right hey direction. no you nailed it it's the Master Sword totally right he gets the Master Sword. <laughs> Is there any significant weapon outside of that staff or that super robot pneumotium thing that you discussed? Um, there are, but they are not um story rel they're not story necessary. Okay. So like in Zelda, Link has to use the Master Sword to defeat Ganon, right? It's like that's okay. what its job is. In Elder Scrolls, you're like, especially in the first two, you're not exactly special. You're just around. So there isn't as much character traits because you you as the player are meant to bring those in. Does your, does your wood elf have a special bow and arrow that he uses that he found on a corpse in this dungeon? Great, that's his special bow and arrow. Um, so I think it's more meant to focus on the player and what they want to do rather than the story deciding for the main character what their thing what what their relevant objects are going to be so like kind of an example of this is that i was playing skyrim one time and i like i just kind of decided i was only going to use daggers and then i like made myself special daggers and those were like my special chosen one daggers uh -huh. the game didn't give me those i made them Really, they were no different than any dagger I could buy in a store, but I made those daggers, and those were my special daggers, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's sort of is like a difference between, like, a true role-playing game and, like, an adventure game, which is kind of more what Zelda is, you know? Okay, yeah. That makes sense. I, even I have heard of the Dova Keen song from Skyrim. Was there yeah. any special music or anything like that that came out of either of these games? Uh, well, so the limitations on what audio could be rendered were strong. So, yeah, Nothing. there's there was music in those games, but it is harsh. <laughs> um, I would say Morrowind is where there is actually some like pretty okay. good. Like I would say that the the score for Morrowind is like holds up. It's excellent. So, would you say this game overall is story oriented or battle oriented? Um, or exploration? I feel like it's more exploration maybe. It's kind of yeah, I would say it's more exploration oriented. It's the the battles can be pretty cool and it, if you ever were to go back and play these, I mean it, it's like it's like melting your eyes bad. But <laughs> And the controls, you move with the arrow keys. It's rough. That, you that know? is clunky. That feels real bad. Yeah, it's not good. Um, but I would not call it story driven because they're you're meant to go and do side quests and do random stuff. I think it's more like role play focused. Like okay, you're yeah, kind of that. writing your own story. It's very emergent gameplay, I think is the right way to put it. Ah, like, okay, yeah. You're supposed to self motivate and go and find your own story within this world. You know, like, yeah, and especially in Daggerfall, when they added enough mechanics and things to do out in the world, I think that became a lot more possible that you could totally just ignore the main story and just go and have your own adventure, and you which is have... always how I've played these games. I've never really done main storyline stuff. I'm just like, I'm Cody the mage. I'm going to do mage stuff. And it's like, <laughs> well, the emperor needs your help. Like, I don't know who that is. I don't care. I'm doing mage things now. <laughs> Emperor can ask any one of these other people, toodles, yo. Yeah. Got it. Does the story... It, I know the story isn't the main point. Does the story intentionally leave unanswered questions for those sequels that come later? Not really. No. Okay, so it's... Uh -uh. The, the, the stories points... are generally pretty self-contained. Got it. Um, they're more like episodic, the story of the septums, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of the secession of the septums. I think that oblivion i think that arena daggerfall and morrowind it's all the same guy um and then i think in oblivion is where there's a new emperor and then skyrim is like many years in the future i think there's been a few since then 
my computer keeps wanting to change septum to september and that's not helping <laughs> me in my notes <laughs> i think it's more that the previous games become mythology is, is the yes. way i would think about it that is i mean that's a really cool way of doing it yeah and that's also a very dungeons and dragons thing like that's frequent true, yeah yeah, that was like kind of a suggested way to end a campaign and start another one if you wanted to keep the same setting is, you know, your heroes go off, you know, when you reach level 20, it's like your heroes become deific adventurers and go off as like become demigods. And then you start as new characters that are aware of like, oh my gosh, this demigod, blah, 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 who was your player character before. That's That's also really cool for the person playing the game because you have this very experiential like oh, I remember when this happened and it didn't happen the way that the bard in this bar is saying that it happened, but yeah. it's close enough, I'm not going to get offended kind of thing and, and move forward. Are there any other media adaptations of the this first couple of stories? I don't think so. There's just a lot of spinoffs. Um, I, I don't think there was ever like a movie or a comic book. I'm sure there's like fan fiction, but oh, beyond yes. that... We, we assume um, rule 34 for all of this. <laughs> um, beyond that, though, there's really not... I don't believe there has been anything else. Okay, then... The arenas are actual arenas. No. Okay. Uh -uh. No, they are not. No, so the arenas were totally abandoned. Um, the reason it's called Elder Scrolls Arena is... Oh, I forgot, to, I forgot to answer this clearly. Yeah, so it was called Elder Scrolls Arena, and then... They stopped having arenas, but it, they had already told all of the publications, like gaming magazines, that it's they were making arena. a game yeah. called Elder Scrolls Arena. So they're like, um, the whole land is an arena because it's chaos now. So just stepping out your front door is an arena. We call it the arena. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you guys just goofed up and undersold your game too early yeah you guys oh that's that's brilliant this is why you have pr people that are like we're just gonna wait till we're a little closer to done and then we'll send the information <laughs> until we've like agreed upon a design document that we won't deviate from and make a whole different game that is no longer related to arenas i mean it's yeah, like you're right it, it started out as mortal Kombat and then became you know the precursor to skyrim oh my gosh i mean that's honestly very cool the fact that it could drift that far and that the team <laughs> could allow it to drift that far and follow it through to create something like transformative for the industry. Yep. They in created time, a buggy mess three months late. I mean, <laughs> hey, I, okay, let's be real. <laughs> Everybody's creating a buggy mess three months late and I will never forgive Mass Effect Andromeda for doing that and I am pissed as hell about it. I was going to say, I, I think that Bethesda is still doing that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are still doing that. It is it is not a Bethesda only thing. No. All right. I think Rockstar has now taken the cake of uh I will release a buggy mess. <laughs> I love you, Rockstar. Send me free things. Yeah, after that endorsement, I'm sure they're just like, dead <laughs> funny, Cody, we'll send him free things. <laughs> you in particular. Oh man. So that's what I have right now on my spreadsheet, on my, on my notes list, guys. That's what I've got for questions. Do you have any other final thoughts of things you think I should know, or do you want to give me that final quiz? I got the final quiz. All right, Let's you ready? This. Yeah. Why is it called Bethesda? It is called Bethesda because they are from Bethesda, Maryland. Yep. Uh, what are the first two names of the games? Arena Daggerfell. Yep. Uh, what is the arena? The arena is everything outside your front door. <laughs> yep, the whole land. What is the Nemodium? The Nemodium is a basically a robot. It is a yep. bronze golem. Uh, where are the Dark Elves from? Dark Elves are from Morrowind. Yep. Who is Uriel Septim? That is the Emperor. Who is Tiber Septim? Tiber Septim. I fucked that up. Uh, <laughs> he was he was the first emperor and he was the first one that used the nemodium ah he was the one that cursed the other dude yeah he cursed the other guy it's just it, it's all a mess and when you start going back i was taking notes as fast as i could and that one went right past me and i was just like that's okay shit i don't think it matters that much yep whoops <laughs> what is the iliac bay the Iliac Bay is the land between 
Hang on. High Rock and Hammerfell. Yep, it's the ocean. Or the ocean, the ocean. yeah, not yeah, land. That, the distinctly that ocean not day. land. Um, what features were added to Daggerfall? Uh, 3D models? Yep, yep, that is a good example. Uh, and what is the Warp of the West? The Warp of the West is where they went into Elder Scrolls 3 and when we don't want to try to reconcile all of the different possible endings, we're going to say they all happened and we move on. <clears throat> that is absolutely correct, Kelsey. Oh I was going to say 10 out of 10, but I actually think it was 9 out of 10, but that's okay. <laughs> I screwed up whoever, Tiber, Tabor, whatever. Tiber. I believe it's Tiber, but I mean, these games were mostly text, so your guess is as good as mine. Oh, did they not have voice actors for these first couple of games? Not all of them. They had, like, voice acting parts, but not the whole game. So a lot of the names you're just reading in games. Oh, I... I am definitely one of those people where I think that if you're going to, like, missay a word that you've only ever read, you deserve full credit for it, even if you're wrong. Like, yeah, you deserve to, to get that one. I have definitely said a few words wrong many, many times. And I'm still saying them wrong because I'll see them in media. They'll bring them up like somebody I appreciate will say the word. And I'm like, that's not how you say that. And I get very upset about it. Turns out I'm wrong. So, Cody, you've you didn't play these two. I, I have played both of them for about an hour total together. Um, Did you enjoy either one of those experiences? No, no <laughs> even a little bit. It's terrible. It's so bad. <laughs> it's it's really bad. Like, and I was playing like patched, remastered versions. They're free, by the way. These games are free, and there's like fan patches and oh, fixes, awesome. so they're not buggy messes anymore. Still unplayable. I mean, <laughs> it, I think. It's worth, like, you can just go and download Arena mm -hmm. and click install and it runs fine on a modern computer. Um, it's worth playing just to be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, your, your render distance is five feet in front of your face. The world doesn't exist beyond that. <laughs> it's so bad. That's terrible. Yeah. Is that a, a, a setting you can adjust? Are there settings in this game? <laughs> There's a setting for volume and there's a setting for detail. De increasing the detail just makes the pictures kind of look worse, in my opinion. <laughs> and, um, yeah, there's no, like, draw distance. That was a limitation of software. Oh, my gosh. That, oh, that sounds, that part sounds genuinely terrible. <laughs> it was bad. It was really bad. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so, do you feel like playing them is an essential part of playing the later games? Or just skip no. and move on? Honestly, I don't think you have to go back and play any of them. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're looking for the most easy-to-approach game, play Skyrim. Like, it's a modern game that still feels really slick and smooth when you play it. Um, the older games, even Oblivion, which is the fourth one, it's it feels its age. Like, it really does. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, like, it's a, it's a different language. What What anything you assume is, like, standard... This is how a computer game works. None of that was present in Arena and Daggerfall. Um, Morrowind's better, um, but it's it's pretty rough. It's still rough to step <laughs> back into. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. So maybe skip those ones. Just watch the DFU, learn what you need to learn, and yeah. then move forward is, is your I would say recommendation on this. Playing Morrowind, I had a good time, but obviously I'm biased. That's the one I started with, but I don't think you need to play these games. <clears throat> all right do you have any other final thoughts nope i'm nope. good all right well cody thank you so much for teaching today i appreciate the time and effort that you put into all of these and that's going to do it for our class on the first two games of elder scrolls as cody hinted that we are going to i believe have more classes on this on on later later ones and if you enjoyed this content please like and subscribe to our channel that helps us continue to grow it also helps if you send this to one of your friends that you're like oh hey i've been playing skyrim and i didn't know all of this just send this to them so that way they know as well and that'll help us grow too in the meantime we look forward to seeing you in our next week's class of dead funny university bye friends bye beautiful